Um, so by way of personal introduction, I'll, a bit of a uh, confession, public confession, I'm very tired. Um, partly because we went out last night, I was in Quebec City, uh, there were hearings taking place on the decommissioning of the Jean T2 reactor in Quebec. Um, Jean Quebec has one reactor, um, and it's actually where I started work on nuclear issues. Uh, there's been a campaign now for about 10 years to get that reactor closed. Um, in September of last year, the Parti Quebecois government announced that they were going to close it. Uh, so there was special commission hearings this week on how they would actually decommission and take the reactor apart, which was very nice for actually having a discussion for once about how you take a reactor apart as opposed to yeah. why we have it or not. Um, so I actually went out with a few colleagues that had been working on this for about 10 years and we had a good toast. Um, and we also uh, reflected a little bit on the past 10 years what had gone out. And while we won't be talking tonight about uh, the, the cost of nuclear power specifically, there's a lot of common themes that went on. Uh, it was kind of a ragtag group of environmental groups that were taking on this reactor. And we were told over and over again uh, by the experts uh, that we didn't know what we were talking about on cost, about the risks, and about safety. Mm -hmm. And what we've been doing over the past 10 years was trying to drag that type of information out into the light so that you could actually have a proper discussion about what are the risks of this project, both financial, environmental, and as we'll talk about today in terms of accident risks. And it took 10 years. Um, and a really great part of the hearings was the head of Hydro-Quebec, so the equivalent of Ontario Power Generation, was cross-examined for about three hours. Um, and so he's someone that we had had a lot of fights with in the past. But he, he basically made known that he had to told the government about three years ago that the project wasn't cost-effective. Um, that they, pr they should not proceed with this project. Um, but it had been covered up. Again, no one, there was no obligation for the government to release this information, so you could have an objective debate or forum about it. Um, they were just keeping it quiet. The reasons, probably a lot of industry influence, uh, but it was a good moment where we actually saw real numbers uh, from the people responsible for these projects. And it has implications here in Ontario. Uh, the, the CEO of Hydro-Quebec was saying it would cost $4 billion to rebuild a reactor in Quebec. Basically the same design that we have in Ontario. Meanwhile here, uh, our government is still telling us it would cost about $2.5 billion. But they're not releasing the information. I have a complaint in at the Information Commissioner's Office right now trying to get those details. Something doesn't add up, but it's a similar theme of where you have groups trying to have discussion on risks, but not actually having all the information. Um, but So there was a success to start with. Um, so thank you for having me today. Uh, and uh, as I said, I started working on nuclear issues around Jean T. I'm an autodidact, so I'm not a, a nuclear engineer. I've spent most of my time learning things, uh, intervening in regulatory commission hearings, um, but also bearing witness to realities like Fukushima. I've been both to Fukushima and Chernobyl, and when you see things like that, it also changes you a little bit, because it's different from the narrative that we're told here by the experts when we see the environmental impacts. What I want to talk to you about tonight uh, it's an hour long, so I'll try to keep my adrenaline up, um, is talk about three things. One is, what does the nuclear industry mean when they use the word safety? They're using it in a very specific way. And it might be different from the way you would think about it. So we're gonna take that apart. So we we're all using words in the right way or understanding how we're communicating. Um, and what does Fukushima say about the industry's use of the word safety? Is it actually bearing out in reality or not? Um, and this gives us some lessons. So if the industry's been telling us one thing about nuclear safety, and we're seeing something in the empirical world, maybe we should learn from that and change our approach to safety. And the third thing is, what is the implications of all this for regulation as part of the talk? Um, and that, I think, falls into two pieces. There's what we ought to be doing from Greenpeace's perspective, and there's what's actually happening out there in reality and kind of having a comparison about why that's taking place. So it's kind of big three chunks. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll go through the first half, pause for a moment, see if there's any initial clarifications, have a drink, and keep going. Um, but that is basically the agenda for the, for the evening. Hmm. Oops. Sorry. I think we're on the right. 
Um, and to start, a bit of a, a framing issue. So again, as I said, the industry uses the word safety in a very specific way. And you know, on the other side, Greenpeace uses the word dangerous in a very different way. Um, so this is the two sides of the nuclear debate before Fukushima. On, on the right hand of the screen, you see the, uh, the annual report of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Fact, <laughs> nuclear in Canada is safe. No caveat. Uh, for those of you that speak French, the version in, in French is actually a step beyond that, where it actually says, fait, the nucléaire, nucléaire est sans danger. So nuclear power is without danger. <laughs> so a very different take on the, what, what they believe about the safety of, of the reactors. Words are important. Um, you know, on the Greenpeace side, you know, nuclear power is dangerous and a waste of time. And what we're talking about in the waste of time is, in recent years, the industry has been trying to use climate change as a reason to build social acceptance. Um, we believe, and it's been borne out over the past 10 years, that it's actually a bit of a Trojan horse. Yeah. You do these big projects, uh, they don't get built on time. And as it comes up, uh, the Gentil reactor, for example, when we started working on it 10 years ago, they said it would cost $800 million to do the project. Mm -hmm. We learned this week it would be $4 billion 10 years later. Wow. So 10 years ago, if we had been having the debate about $4 billion, what could we do with $4 billion to stop climate change? It'd be very different. So this is a very polarized debate. And where is there anywhere in between, you know, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about risk and different perspectives on risk. Um, I pulled out uh, one of the objectives of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Control Act. Um, so this is the legislation uh, that basically frames how nuclear safety is regulated in Canada. Um, the two most important points are the limitation to a reasonable level. So there's the important word, reasonable. What is reasonable? Um, of the risks. So again, that's what we're, they're regulating. So what is a reasonable risk for us to take? And again, from the Greenpeace perspective, we look at things like Fukushima and Chernobyl and we say that's not a reasonable. On the CNSC side and the industry side, they say it's perfectly safe, but they're constructing risk in a different way that we need to understand. And then there, sorry, the slide here, um, goes into, again, what is the perception of these two sides? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the past 10 years with Jean Zee, uh, you know, we were told over and over again by the experts in the industry, we'll be able to do this on time and on budget, it's cost effective. Um, those are the experts. And the way they're viewed typically is objective, analytical, scientific, data-driven, rational. That's the way it's presented. Um, on the other side, and I've bumped into this a lot personally, I interact a lot with people in the industry, and I'm often accused of, in personal conversations, of being religious or emotional <laughs> about the topic. Where those of you that know me, I'm kind of stayed boring, um, not that motive. Um, but it's seen as subjective, emotional, uh, political and intuitive, irrational. Um, and that's the way the debate tends to be framed. And this is a quote from um, someone that was involved in uh, just general regulation in the United States. Um, when they disagree, experts are generally right and ordinary people are generally wrong. Does he believe that? <laughs> I hope I think so. Um, and I think the thing you'll get out of my presentation today is even though it's been framed this way, what we've seen with Fukushima is this side of the debate that's been cast or portrayed as being subjective and emotional, um, has act, there, the skepticism has been validated by what we've been seeing over the past 30 years. There was a very useful, you know, pretty on target conception of what the risk of reactors are. It's very different from the experts. But that's not what's actually in our regulation. Um, and uh, here's a few quotes um, called nuke speak on safety. Again, that word safety, it, it's amazing how the industry will use uh, the word safety without caveats, caveats but also in the superlative. Um, and what goes on, it usually has to do with nationalism. Is every country in the world has a different reactor design and they all are dangerous at some level, but they all say in their own fora, you know, our reactor design is the safest. Um, you know, up here in 1983, before the Chernobyl disaster, you know, you have someone from the Russian Atomic Energy Agency saying, you know, accidents are practically impossible. <laughs> Three years later, an accident happened. 
Uh, just last year, just a month or two years ago now, uh, before the Fuk Fukushima disaster, you have someone from the Japanese government saying their reactors are the world's safest. Um, and it goes on here in Canada as well. Uh, there's a reason why the Kandu reactor is called Kandu. It's based out of 1960s nationalism. We're developing, we're going to play with the big boys and the big countries with this new technology. And uh, here you are um, just after the Fukushima disaster. Um, again, I think nuclear plants here in Canada are probably the safest in the world. We're not using the word risk, but again, it's always, and what the comparison is, but this is the way things are portrayed out there in the world as part of the debate. And so what does this word safety mean to them? And this is where you have to take a few steps back. When the industry's saying a reactor is safe, what it means is they believe that nuclear accidents, like a major accident, like a meltdown, would only happen once every million years of reactor operation. Sounds a little absurd, and it, it may be to normal people. Um, and what, what they use is this probabilistic approach, where they make a lot of assumptions. It's mostly made up, uh, where they say, you know, a reactor operating for 30 years you know, because it would be once in a million years of reactor operation, the risk of running that reactor, you know, that's reasonable. We can take that risk. Um, that's what they mean by safe. When it, and when you go back to what the government of Canada, this is the wrong thing to do, um, in the Nuclear Safety Control Act, when they talk about reasonable level of risk and limiting risk, that's what they say is reasonable. That's how they're regulating. Is, well, it's a fine thing for the government to you know, support this, because once in a million years, given the benefits, we should be allowed to go ahead with this. So that's what the industry believes. And I think, I, I would say in this case, it is a belief. Um, we can't, pre uh, you know, predicting a million years <laughs> is something else. Uh, and what we we're actually seeing worldwide is there's been five reactors with core melt, just for power reactors. There's been other ones for smaller reactors that have happened. We have about 14,000 years of reactor operation worldwide when you add all the reactors up. So it means instead of once every million years, we're seeing, you know, it comes out to about once every, yeah, once every million years for 440 reactors operating worldwide, you should see one meltdown every 250 years using their theory. What we're actually seeing is a meltdown somewhere in the world about once a decade. So, that's the difference between their version of safety and what we're actually seeing on the ground. And I can, I can tell you right now, this is the hard thing they're trying to figure out. How do they, you know, they're bending over backwards trying to rationalize this difference right now. But this is a fair difference. The skepticism, the public skepticism of this assumption of like, how could you know a million years? In fact, is borne out to be true with Fukushima, with Three Mile Island, and with Chernobyl. So one of the big things is probability, as a conclusion, probability theory is unsafe. That's the backbone of nuclear regulation in Canada internationally, and it's what's used to justify reactor operation. But if we were to input empirical data into that, we wouldn't be able to use that justification. And you know what we did see at Fukushima, uh, what they tend to tell us again through this whole probabilistic method is that really all these technical barriers, they call it defense in depth. So the reactor des are designed to control the reaction, cool it, and then at the last level contain it so it doesn't get out into the environment. And the argument is with all those technical barriers, that's why it would only be about once in a million years that you have this major accident. What happened with Fukushima is radioactive releases happened within the first 25 hours. Twenty-four hours. So all those barriers that they said once in a million just happened. Um, and a, another example, of just the, technolo the technological, the belief that the technology can handle this has been bearing out in reality. So, and, and this gets into, again, with Fukushima, the, the gut, in, or the response usually that we see in the media and from the industry is to just simply dismiss it. Um, it was the freak act of nature. We could have never seen that one coming. Um, you know, before Fukushima, of course, they said, we've planned for everything. We are ready. After Fukushima, well, you know, you 
how could you expect that to happen? What in reality happened, what's amazing in reality when you look back, you know, afterwards, is they had the studies that showed the likelihood of a tsunami like that was about once in a thousand years. It should have been something that they designed for. Um, they gave an approval to one of the Fukushima reactors for life extension two weeks before the disaster happened and didn't require them to upgrade the plant to, uh, to stop the tsunami. But they had risk assessments, both the regulator and the operator, saying we should expect this. Uh, in J Japan, for example, history, what was going on with some of the communities, they would actually put stones on, uh, along the shore to actually show where in the past tsunamis had gone up. So there's some historic record of how that hit. Um, but those, both the regulator and the operator of TEP, TEPCO, the operator, knew about this risk. It was in their own studies, and they simply ignored it. In their own belief, because when you start talking all the time of, well, our technology is so safe, we have the safest reactors in the world, you start to believe it. And you start to dismiss risk, human, human pride, right? And what is basically what Greenpeace put out a report, and it's since um, a lot of other experts have come to the same conclusion, um, something called institutional failure was the cause of Fukushima. The institutions that were charged with protecting the public and the environment, when they were aware of the risks and they didn't react to it to protect the environment and, and the people of Japan, that was a failure of those institutions to carry out the mandate. And it happened for a lot of reasons. Uh, we'll talk about regulatory capture. Uh, one thing that goes on is there's not a lot of independent nuclear experts out there. You either work for the regulator or you work for the industry. And what usually happens is, well, you work for the regulator for a while, hop over to OPG right. and back and forth. Uh, that goes on here in Ontario. Um, yeah. OPG mm -hmm. hired the head of regulatory affairs from CNSC in 2006 to oversee uh, their regulatory approach to the life extension of small reactors. Uh, in Japan, the government, it's actually part of the culture, the government actually has a ministry that parachutes regulators into the industries they used to regulate when they retire. So what this created was a bit of an echo chamber effect. It is back and forth, again, well, it's very safe, and the probability of such an accident is this one in a million years. You know, we don't actually need to spend the money to do that. That reinforced itself over and over again, partly because those studies that exist now, we know about them now. But did the public, like you and me, have access to that four years ago, where we, in a form where we could actually challenge the, the people making the decisions? Probably not. So there's a whole problem with kind of getting some outside light, people with a different perspective on this industry, um, to comment on the risks that are being imposed on them. Um, so interesting thing with institutional failure, it's also the conclusions of the, the, the uh, inquests into the Chernobyl disaster, as well as Three Mile Island, pointed to this as a cause. If you look at what happened in the banking industry in 2009 in that crisis, another industry that's highly, highly complex, the type of thing most of us don't understand, the derivatives and what the risks are, um, the banking crisis was also attributed partly to institutional failure. Um, and when you have these complex industries that are also high risk and all the information is kind of kept between two bodies, that's where you become exposed to that. Uh, the same issue happened with the oil spill um, in the Gulf of Mexico, <coughs> institutional failure, where they actually said the regulator was not actually enforcing the rules. Um, so the conclusion, institutional failure is a, contributed, con a significant contributor to risk, but these risk assessments that the industry does they don't even quantify that. They're not putting this into their models. I've asked the CNSC to do this, and they're like, well, we don't know how to do that, so we just don't look at it. But of course, it's still once in a million years. That's problem. Um, another lesson that comes out of Fukushima, and Greenpeace is going to be working on this uh, more this year, is an issue with responsibility. So while the industry keeps saying that our reactors are safe, our nation's reactors are the safest in the world, those same people that run those companies, those companies are unwilling to assume the risk, the accident risk, the liability for accidents. They're saying one thing publicly, 
their accountants and their insurers yeah. are looking at the numbers and the uncertainty in the data another way and saying we want to be shielded from that. And what has happened is in Canada and in Japan, there's a law um, that indemnifies the suppliers of reactors. So uh, TEPCO, the company, had to pay out compensation to the public um, for damages. But General Electric, who designed the reactors, um, hasn't had to pay a cent. Billions in profit. Um, but they have been completely absolved of financial liability for that. And there's an issue with that, is what we're learning with General Electric, is General Electric was aware of certain de design flaws in the containment that, let's say, helped, were pathways to radioactive releases. So it was a contributor to the actual accident and the damages. But any other industry, except the offshore oil and gas industry, <laughs> um, you'd be able to sue General Electric, have a bigger pot of money to compensate victims, uh, but with the nuclear industry, you don't. So one, there's an issue of justice right now, what we're seeing in Japan. There's still 100,000 people that are refugees, that have lost their livelihoods, lost their communities, uh, lost a lot of money. Um, will they ever be compensated in full? Uh, but then there's the, the, the other negative um, part that comes out of this liability protection is it encourages risky behavior. So if General Electric was aware of this, and they were also liable, their behavior would have changed. They would have probably fixed that reactor. That's why you have liability. And you're grown up. <laughs> Take responsibility for your actions. Um, this is a big issue coming, I think, out of the Fukushima disaster. We've had the, the issue of institutional failure contributing to it. But it's also this double speak where the industry is saying, oh, it's perfectly safe. We can dismiss things like tsunamis. Um, but at the same time, being unwilling to take responsibility for this risk, so low probability. There's a, a huge contradiction here. And it also validates, again, what the subject, subjective emotional public has always asked about the nuclear industry and its operations. So why is there actually liability protection? Um, this could be a whole other presentation uh, that if you want, I can do at another point. Uh, but in the 1950s in the United States, uh, they had the bomb program, they were trying to develop the safe, the peaceful atom, and when the government was trying to privatize it, all the companies said, no way, we're doing that. Uh, so they developed something called the Price-Anderson Act um, that protects suppliers. Um, and then when they went to export American reactors to Europe, uh, a bunch of pointy heads got together at Harvard of lawyers, and they developed kind of these principles of nuclear liability that they basically say, uh, persuaded these other countries to say, you're going to buy our reactors, you need to protect our, our vendors. So Westinghouse, if there's an accident uh, at one of their reactors overseas, is not responsible at all. Um, this came from the, the 1950s. Uh, this is a, a text from an International Atomic Energy Agency document where it basically said, says explicitly <coughs> the reason why we have this liability protection is to encourage the industry. We want them to do this. So it's not about controlling the risk and protecting the public. It's actually about encouraging the industry to develop. Promise, yeah. <laughs> um, and one final piece here um, that I think is quite interesting, and it'll take a minute to tease this out. On screen, um, there's a quote from the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in, in the United States. Former head because he got pushed out by the Republicans a while ago. Another story. Um, but after Fukushima, he made a very interesting analysis that didn't make him friends with the industry he was regulating. Uh, is that all these models, under current nuclear safety rules internationally, Fukushima is an acceptable accident. So they say we have these great standards that protect the public. According to the rules, that accident is acceptable. And the reason for that is, is they're basically designed so in the event that there's a radiation release, there'll be just enough time that you can evacuate the public around the reactor. And there'll be no immediate deaths. It's about immediate deaths. It's not about long-term deaths. So in that way, no one, the industry talks about this a lot in North America. Well, Fukushima wasn't that big of a deal. No one's died yet from the radiation. And that's based on their rules. 
they're cherry picking what the impact is. When you look in Japan, you know, the Japanese people since Fukushima, but this is completely unacceptable, shut all the reactors down. They're basically saying those standards aren't socially acceptable. It is not a reasonable limitation on risk to the public. Shut the reactors down. Um, here the NRC commissioner is basically saying that. You know, right now it's, it's easy to get away with this, but in the event of an accident, the public is going to say, as happened in like this is not an acceptable event. Um, so this is another lesson that we need to think about in Canada, because our rules are the same. And in the next part of my speech, when we're talking about risk, we talked a lot about probability, um, frequency, the predicted frequency. But the other side of risk is consequence. And what the nuclear industry does in their mindset, in their, the way they present risk, is they'll talk about the probability, but the high consequence events that we've seen a number of times, they don't put that in the equation. So when they look at what the end risk is that they're presenting to the public, it's, it's one-sided. Meanwhile, us, we're like, Fukushima, I don't want that here. But that is not in their models. It's not what they look at. They don't look at the fact, for example, that uh, sure you may be able to evacuate the people around Darlington or Pickering in the event of an accident. That's questionable. Uh, but still, according to the rules, you could evacuate everybody. No, that's, that's acceptable. But is it acceptable to lose a big part of the city of Toronto? That aspect of the consequence isn't in their risk assessment. And this is another lesson out of Fukushima. Um, right there, I'll, I don't know how quickly I'm going. I'll take a little pause. Any quick clarifications while I have a sip? No? No. Uh, wasn't Fukushima built in a boatman? Wouldn't that immediately be a risk? That's my question, yeah. Well, see, see this is a very good point as well, is before, the Japanese are world experts in earthquake risks and tsunami risks. The Japanese have advised other countries, like India, about how to protect themselves from tsunamis, their reactors. But they were blind when it came to their own reactors about that, you know, that actual threat. These, they were convinced themselves about the safety of the reactors. That they don't them strongly, strongly so that's part of this, this mindset of when you're using safety as opposed to risk constantly, without any caveat, you begin to believe yourself, especially when you're just with other people that believe the exact same thing. You get this regulatory capture. As I said, they had, they had the study. They knew about the earthquake risks, and they knew about the tsunami risks. They just didn't say, we should actually make a regulation out of this and apply it. There's a Feynman quote I heard recently after the successful blasts over Japan. 45, you said that we weren't thinking. Yeah, these are all the, sci the, the, the greatest scientists in the world. You can get very caught up with your own uh, gadgets. Um, it is, again, I think part of the, the engineering mindset in the, within the industry. Excuse uh, me, who's responsible though? Who is responsible? Who takes responsibility? Well, this is another really good question that gets into the liability question. Is the, the industry saying everything is safe, but when it comes down to who is accountable, who is responsible for hurting other people, no one is. They're protected under the law. TEPCO, the operator of the reactor, has been liable for several billion dollars, and then the government bailed it out. But everyone else that contributed to that in the industry, and including the regulator, they're off, you know, no, no offense to the Scots. Scott Fruit? Mm-hmm. Part Scott Fruit, is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the, the, the tax, the people are responsible. Yeah, the public. Sorry? I mean, the people are responsible. It's yeah. social, socializing of, of the consequences <laughs> yeah. and privatizing of the progress. Exactly. The moral habit. You just made a comment about engineering. Um, I'd like to comment on that later, but um, I don't actually agree with that. It's to do with the risk and the money component that then removes correct engineering. I'll expand on that at the end of your talk, if I may. Sure, sure. Um, so from here, I'm going to move on about um, from those were the causes, what we're learning two years later. And we'll continue to learn lessons as the years go on. Um, but are we learning Fukushima's lessons? No. Um, you know, both at the international level and here in Canada. Um, you know, some of the things we can take away, empirical probability of meltdown is about once, once a decade somewhere in the world. It's not low frequency, it's regular frequency. 
institutional failure has been the cause, not a freak act of nature. Um, you know, not the bad Russian design. And political influence over the regulator has also been a big part of that. Um, that comes into this mindset of what is the mandate to protect the public or actually promote this technology. Um, and the final point, risk without responsibility uh, encourages risky behavior. If you don't have to pay for the consequences of your actions, mm. you're going to take more risks. Again, it'll be socialized in the end. Why not? You can make money in the interim. So what would this mean for nuclear regulation? Um, first of all, simple technical solutions aren't going to ad address these root causes. You can reduce some of the risk. So what the Canadian regulator has been doing a lot of is looking at how they would deal with loss of on-site power, putting in more generators. So they're aware of a new accident scenario, and they're addressing that. That can mitigate some of the risk, but it's not going to remove the problem of institutional failure. What are they going to miss in the Canadian context? Um, a big one is current risk models underestimate accident risk. And this one, I don't think the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission or the International Atomic Agency has addressed this. They're still using the same old models and claims, even though the paradigm arguably should change of the way they do this. Um, and third one, again, this won't get rid of the risk, but it could mitigate the risk. Um, putting responsibility on the industry, people that contribute to it for such events. There will be an incentive there to change. These three things we're not really seeing happening in the world. So what is happening in the world? Well, some countries have just completely changed course. They've said this risk is not worth it. Uh, the quote on screen um, from Angela Merkel, who used to be pro-nuclear, um, Fukushima happened, uh, she had reversed the nuclear phase out in Germany, Fukushima happened, and she actually sped it up. So she outdid the Greens, they were a little confused by it all. Um, <laughs> what do we do now? What do we ask for? Um, but she, uh, as she basically says here, this has changed forever the way we look at the risk of these things. And she said that as well, I think she's a chemist. Or, um, Quantum and, chemistry. Pardon me? Quantum chemistry. Quantum, I don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> but she changed her, Germany has done this, as has Belgium, uh, Switzerland, um, have all said, you know what, it's not worth mitigating the risk. We're just going to eliminate the risk and be precautionary. So that's one approach. Um, and Japan as well, uh, there's being a, a bit of oscillation on that, but they've sh I think there's only one reactor operating in Japan right now. Okay. Um, and so the country went from highly nuclear dependent to again what I said about the these standards are just no longer acceptable in that society. Um, when I was in Japan two years ago, um, Greenpeace wasn't a very popular organization, by the way, in Japan because of the whaling issue. Uh, when some of my colleagues arrived at the airport with radiation detectors, it's kind of hard to get through an airport with them. Um, and explain what they were doing. The police. The, the, the national police were just overwhelmed and happy that they were there helping. Because it was one of, Greenpeace was one of the only organ, independent organizations that was out there providing information on the accident. Yeah. And we continue to do that as a rule. Um, and the whole trust issue, the, the public had been told for years, yeah. it's all safe. And then after the accident, there's been a whole bunch of issues about uh, towns that weren't, we found a town, for example, that should have been evacuated. Uh, with radiation levels, um, but the government had done nothing. So we had to do a press conference, expose the fact that these people should be evacuated, and then the government acted the next week. Um, there's those ongoing problems in the country. Um, so yeah, Japan as well, while I was there, uh, had just passed its own Green Energy Act, and went from looking to build reactors to shutting them all down, to now saying we're going to invest massively mm. in renewables along with Germany. Huge change in life. Um, and as I mentioned, other countries have done it, like Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, are all looking to phase out their reactors now um, and developing plans for it. I think Switzerland's having a referendum to bring it up quicker in the next few months. Um, this is a little out of date now. Japan shut down most of its reactors. Um, there's been a practical freeze in a lot of jurisdictions on new reactors, on the approvals. Canada was quite different in that. Uh, the federal government and the Ontario government started hearings on building new reactors at Darlington one week after Fukushima happened. 
the environmental movement asked them to pause the hearings to learn some of the lessons, mm -hmm. and they refused. So we, as a country, are in a very different space than some of the other countries mm. in the world. Mm. Um, China, as well, a uh, country that's always talked about as part of the nuclear renaissance, uh, it suspended construction of a lot of reactors. They just released their latest five-year energy plan last week, and they've moved their target down for building reactors. Mm. Subtle things, they're not attributing it to Fukushima, but the world's changing. Um, then safety checks and potentially um, leading to regulatory changes. Uh, this is where it gets very political. Um, in the United States, for example, uh, the NRC uh, was told by some of the Republicans in Congress, do not require safety upgrades that cost the industry too much money. So again, it's like we're prioritizing the industry over the yeah. profits of the industry. And the big thing is that last hope, they used to talk a lot about a nuclear renaissance. It's pretty much dead on arrival now. You can talk about it, but it's not happening. Um, so just the frame of where the world of the debate is going has changed a lot. Um, and in Canada, you know, we shouldn't be too smug. There's a lot of parallels, and I would argue we have conditions that are ripe um, for institutional failure in Canada. Uh, on screen is a woman named Linda Keane. She was the former president of the Canadian Nuclear <coughs> Safety Commission. She kind of has the honor of being one of the first regulators that the Harper government kicked out. They've moved on to some others since then. Um, and the, the reason at the time was they said she was not handling the radioisotope crisis. A reactor at Chalk River that was really old. ACL was trying to build new reactors to replace it. They never could, so they kept asking to push out this, the life of this older, unsafe reactor. Um, and they used that as a reason to fire her. What was also going on, however, was she uh, was the first president of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission under the Canadian Nuclear Safety Control Act. Came into to power in 2000, or into, uh, into operation in 2000, and one of the mandates was to apply international nuclear safety standards. If you read that act, it says nothing about money or people, it's all about the environment, but Harper changed it, correct? Yes, he changed. Because he broke section 49K, I think, when he fired her. You've really read it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and he, they did end up changing the act, and what the act does now is when the regulator, instead of just making safety decisions, there's now some lines in it about also taking into account the impacts of, say, shutting a reactor down on electricity supply or radioisotope supply. So again, they're changing the cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. Um, but what she has basically said, and I've got a lot of it from kind of a paper trail through access to information, what was happening here in Ontario is the nuclear industry, uh, their last hope of building a reactor here in Ontario. Um, around 2005, they're pushing in a new energy plan. They wanted to build new reactors quickly. They had this new advanced <coughs> can-do design. Um, even back then, they didn't think they would get it on online in time to uh, um, stop, I think, the competition renewables. Um, so what they went to her, to Linda Keene, and basically said, uh, we don't want international standards. We want to build a CANDU-6. CANDU-6 is the reactor that's in operation, well, no longer in operation in Quebec, designs from the 1970s. They asked her to grandfather all, all of the nuclear safety rules. So it's basically, you want, you know, it's like Ford going to the safety regulator and saying, we want you to allow us to build cars like we did in the 1970s. Because we built them already, they're safe. Um, she said no. And what that meant was, a company called SNC Lavalin, you may know them for their appearances in Libya, um, as well as the Charbonneau Commission in Quebec um, into corruption. Uh, they wanted, they've since bought Atomic Energy of Canada Limited for the fe from the federal government for about $15 million. Um, and uh, they are, when you look at candy projects internationally, they were the ones that always poured the cement. Those, they poured the cement. <laughs> So they got to do all the building, and then Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, when there was a cost overrun, they would just pass the bill up, and that would end up on tax cards. It was a great racket for a long time. Um, but they wanted to build the reactor here in Ontario. It was money for them. They ended up calling her to, she spoke at a SNC Lavalin board meeting in around 2007. Fire, I think she was fired by 2008, I forget the exact date. 
but she has basically said in other media and in nuclear industry media, uh, they hired Hill and Knowlton um, to get her fired, and the government fired her. And since then, uh, for those of you that do partake in the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, there's a new president. His behavior is very different. Um, very flashy PowerPoints. Uh, but they also put out uh, annual reports, like the one I just showed you, where it says nuclear power is safe or energy nucléaire is sans danger, very much on communicating. He, uh, whenever the nuclear industry is criticized in the media, for example, you'll often see a letter from the head of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission defending it. So different mindset. Um, she, this did every, she did everything 100% correct, though, didn't she? She just wouldn't relicense it. She didn't close it down because people thought she closed it down, but she just wouldn't relicense it because the mandate, it was to do with water and water pumps and water supplies, correct? And also the installation of seismically uh, resistant backup yeah. generators, which in retrospect was probably a very good idea. And again, the re what the industry was saying about these backup generators was, well, that's such a low probability event in the Ottawa Valley. We shouldn't require us to do that. But they ignored all the seismic information. Yeah. And this is a good example of it's happening here. Um, and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has basically been politicized by the, Canadian, the, the Harper government. That worries me a lot. I deal with them a lot. Um, and uh, one of the big things that you've seen uh, since she was fired, after she was fired, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, she said you couldn't license a CANDU-6 reactor uh, in Canada. One of the reasons it's not terrorist resistant, uh, but it also has some other design flaws that aren't accepted anymore under international <coughs> safety standards. It's less passively safe than other reactor designs. She got fired, and immediately Atomic Energy of Canada applied for licensing of that very reactor, and they're still applying to build it at the Darlington site, um, east of Toronto. So that's being permitted now. Um, and now this goes into Canada's response to the Fukushima disaster. How are we actually learning those lessons? So as I mentioned, 10 days after uh, the Fukushima disaster began, uh, there was hearings out in Curtis, Ontario on uh, the proposal to build new reactors at Darlington, just 10 days after. We, they've been studying the project for about four years. Um, the environmental movement and a lot of other civil society groups said, let's take a pause, learn some lessons, and then we can continue. It is a reactor. <laughs> um, and we were just told no. Uh, in following that, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission started its own uh, task force, I think in May or April. Um, and one of the big things is, it's all about how you frame the question. <clears throat> and if you look at their, uh, uh, their terms of reference for the Fukushima task force, they're looking at, remember I mentioned the technical issues, the upgrades? They're looking at basically the technical issues that caused the Fukushima disaster, not necessarily the approach to nuclear safety, not necessarily the institutional failures. Uh, they're looking at would this, you know, could this handle an earthquake? Could this handle a tsunami? Um, and that's a, since then they've been coming out over and over again saying we're adapting to Fukushima, but it's a bit of a PR show. Um, I've intervened in that process a lot. Uh, we put in evidence into that process saying, you know, all Greenpeace and academics are saying this was caused by institutional failure. Um, you know, this approach to risk communication as well. Um, this is their response to me uh, in March 2012. That's just not in the scope of our review. So we don't have to look at it. But our conclusions are everything's fine. Um, now I'm going to do a bit of a case study really quickly. Um, and what does this mean day to day for nuclear regulations? Uh, there's some of you in the room uh, intervening in hearings on, on the proposal to build these four reactors here at Darlington. Um, they want to rebuild these four reactors uh, starting around 2016. They say it's 2.5 billion each. Quebec Wait says it's four. I want to see which one of the four reactors. So right here is Darlington. Yeah. So here's one unit, two unit, three, four. Thank you. Um, and they want to build new build, I think, over here on the same site. And there's a bunch of issues, like generally about this, that are related to Fukushima as well. Ontario and Japan and South Korea are one of the few places where the um, generators build reactors in big sets. You usually see one or two. What that means is the cumulative hazard on site is bigger. Um, and a, a, an example of how 
the Japanese are actually better than us. So each of the Fukushima reactors, three of them released radiation. Each of them had separate safety systems. So as an engineer, there was more redundancy. One of them didn't release radiation, it actually worked to a certain extent. But here at Darlington, what they did is that containment is shared between four reactors and is only designed to deal with one core melt at a time. They did this to save money in the 1970s. You wouldn't be allowed to build this under international atomic energy standards today because there's not enough redundancy. It's not enough redundancy. I know. I worked. Oh, yeah, did you? Um, and uh, this, the CNSC, we raised it at the hearings, and it's like, well, it's a reasonable risk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so going forward in this process, there's been an environmental assessment going on um, on that. And a lot of environmental groups have been saying to them, you know, we need to learn lessons from Fukushima in this review. Um, you know, we ask things like, oops, you're right about this. You know, you need to address uh, in the environmental screening report institutional failure. You know, um, they refused. They, they said in response to me, they, they actually acknowledged that it existed, which was a first. Um, but they just said, we don't know how to quantify it. But we won't put the word uncertainty in this document. Um, even though the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act says you're supposed to evaluate projects in a precautionary manner. Just won't, they won't give the word uncertainty anything. Um, you know, the, the low probability issue, again, uh, they just accepted, and we'll talk about this in a bit, OPG's probability forecasts. Um, and this is a big issue in an environmental review because what they've done is excluded big accidents from the environmental review. <laughs> so when you come to conclusions about possible environmental effects, you don't look at those environmental effects. And they use this probability theory to do that. So my assessment of the situation is, it's just business as, as, as usual here in Canada. And this is, again, how probability theory gets used in environmental review. This is that one in a million years number that we talked about. So what they do is they use this as a line. They call these credible accidents. So these are accidents that they believe reasonably could occur, and these incredible accidents. So in an environmental review, what they do is, a very interesting thing with risk, is that this line, they just stop looking at consequence. They don't have to look at any of this. This is what you and me are worried about, I'm assuming. Um, this is what we're seeing in Fukushima. But just this arbitrary line, they just don't look at that. Um, we asked them to. Uh, they said no. Uh, the province of Ontario, actually, that is charged with emergency planning, actually asked them to look at accidents up here as well, a farther probability out, because they wanted to actually ensure that they could deal with more extreme events. And the CNSC told the Ontario government no. It's pretty amazing. Um, so this is very, very, very rigid. Um, and this, again, when you get into risk assessment, this is what they're not looking at. And what does that look like? Uh, this is a chart. There's very little information. They don't release very much. I've tried to get their probabilistic risk assessments. They won't release them. Um, they've relented and released a summary. And one of the things that shocked me that they did is the first time they ran their probabilistic risk assessment, this is an accident right here. They would consider credible. But this accident is actually a huge accident. It would kill 3,000 people. So what did they do? They enhanced the model to get it over this line, so it's over here. So that way they don't have to look at an environmental review. And you can do that when it's at one in a million years, because this is one in a million, this is one in 10 million, 10 million. Um, so you get this sort of gaming with the line. Um, and that shows actually how vulnerable these types of risk assessments are when you don't have outside people looking at them. Um, because to them, it's like, well, it's one in a million years. What's the big deal if we push it out a little farther? Um, so they basically manipulated the risk assessment. They say they've enhanced it um, to push probabilities up. So garbage in, garbage in. Um, but that said, this accident, they've at least acknowledged might happen. And it's a huge accident. Um, and it's just over their line, but they won't look at it. Just, that, just 3,000 people, that's all. It's OK. It's, and that's deaths, right? It's not looking at the other environmental factors of abandoned land 
impacts on Lake Ontario for drinking water. Um, there's a whole bunch of environmental factors that would come with that. And when you think about where Darlington is, you start to ask yourself, is, you know, is this a reasonable risk if we have other options? You change the debate if you talk about that. And these are immediate deaths. Yeah. Uh, those are actually latent deaths. Latent? Yeah. I would, the way they give you the numbers, Sorry. you can't um, calculate immediate deaths. So you're talking about cancer 40 years on? Yeah. Or it's by based on public dose. You can there's a multiplier. It's really general. But I've asked again. You can do better calculations, and I've wanted to hire someone for a while to do just models. But you need what they call source term data um, of what radioisotopes they would release. They won't release that to me. And they say because it's too dangerous. If we release this information to you, terrorists would realize well, what a great target this is. This is their basic argument. <laughs> the terrorists probably already know this stuff, but you can find it. You know, you researched Chalk River over the last no, a number of years, and all that stuff sits in there to read. Exactly. It's a totally bogus argument, but they won with the information question. The terrorism shield uh, is a big thing, and it's another, I think it's a big, since September 11th, there's a CNSC staffer actually once admitted to me who's very pro nuclear? He said, I actually believe safety margins have gone down since September 11th because we're releasing less information. Yeah. Honest guy. <laughs> but try to get it now. They'll hide behind the shield. Um, and this gets a, again into the, the quote from um, the former head of the NRC. You know, is this a reasonable risk? We have the Pickering Nuclear Station here, the Darlington Nuclear Station here. Uh, there's six operating reactors at Pickering, four at Darlington. They share safety systems. And if we were including other things in their model, if we were looking at that consequence, we'd be having a very different, in response to what you were asking, we'd be having a very different public debate. Because people would be aware of the consequences. That's why they're withholding the information. Because they want to portray risk in a very different way. Did, did they ever mention the fault line that runs close to them? They have a lot of study, yeah, they mention it, and they'll use probabilities to keep it out and that the, they've dealt with it, it's a reasonable risk. So that links straight through the San Andreas all the way through the support line, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and, an interesting thing, uh, colleagues in New Brunswick have been fighting the, uh, the Point Lepro nuclear station, and one of the things they raised is they didn't require, they didn't do a study of seismic risks before they allowed them to refurbish it, and they forced them to do such a study, and they published a precy of it about a week ago, and the colleague in New Brunswick said when you look at that as a contributor risk, it would make an ac a large accident point for pro reasonable in their terms. But they've just kind of kept the study. Now that the reactor is rebuilt, they'll say, well, it's not reasonable to require more upgrades. Um, and quickly here, finally, so that's that's the issue with what the, you know, <clears throat> in a better world, if we were addressing Fukushima, we'd be starting looking at risk in a different manner. Um, we have a lot more transparency on these things. We try to break up the echo chamber. Um, that's not happening in Canada. Uh, the other piece that's coming out of this, and I spoke before about the issue of responsibility and this liability protection, GE's contribution uh, to the Fukushima disaster. So the International Atomic Energy Agency has been putting out all these reports on how, how do we address Fukushima. And instead of saying, oh, well, GE actually may have been negligent in that, we should think about that and how we address it, the response of the international, the, the IAEA and the industry is instead of opening up, making the industry more responsible, it's actually about tightening the liability rules or strengthening them for the industry. So what they're now looking to do, this is, there's a lot of acronyms in here, but there, there's these international conventions, they're going to try to get as many countries as possible, including Canada, to cross indemnify with these conventions to protect the suppliers. So that's, again, to your question about understanding what the industry is doing. They're using Fukushima to protect themselves more because they understand the risk. Um, we're not having the debate on opening up the liability more, which is something Greenpeace is going to try to do in the next year. And it also has impacts in Canada. This is an article, um, my great graphic design skills, um, from uh, Reuters in November. And uh, Canada broke off relations with India in the 1970s because they used Canoe technology to develop a bomb. Uh, the George Bush administration opened up those relations again, partly because the vendors 
India is one of the countries where the vendors think they can make money by selling reactors. Part of the deal, however, was that, again, like the 1950s, George Bush said, you can buy our reactors, we'll ignore the non-proliferation treaty, but you need to protect our vendors, like Westinghouse, with liability protection. Um, one of the things that Greenpeace did in India, uh, India has a very interesting relationship with this type of thing because of Bhopal. Mm -hmm. We worked on a campaign and got some uh, uh, academic and legal um, uh, advice around what is this actually legal under the Indian Constitution, and just raised the whole issue of the government is a lot, could allow for another Bhopal. But the public came out very against this legislation, even though the public wants to buy reactors. And they changed the law so that it's unlike the Canadian law. And there's a little, little, little window in the law where, in the event of an accident, suppliers could be sued. It's a really small opening. That's good. What's happened since then? No company, international company, has been willing to sell a reactor to India for the past three years. <laughs> They're all lobbying the Indian government now to close that loophole. Mm -hmm. So what that tells you, that is their assessment of the risk of their own reactors. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I hate to say, there's our friends at SNC Lavalin. They're here saying, you know, we've Canada signed, a, Harper was there in November, opened up relations, and, you know, theoretically we could sell reactors. SNC Lavalin says, no, we're not doing that unless we're not selling them a can do. They won't sell them the same can do that they want to build at Darlington unless they're protected. <laughs> so that's what they think of their own technology. So they're post Fukushima, the industry is actually trying to protect itself more. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, I think I've been about an hour. <laughs> uh, you know, I think three takeaways on. Um, you know, lessons from Fukushima, you know, there's the reality, uh, the probability of a meltdown. Uh, it's not what they say. Their concept of safety needs to be challenged. We should be using the word risk and talking about what kind of risk that is. And that should include consequences, not just probabilities. So we're seeing something once a decade in the world, a major accident. Institutional failure, just like the banking industry, just like the BP oil spill, complex industries has been the cause. It wasn't a tsunami. Um, and risk without responsibility in, encourages this type of behavior. Um, if you're going to have nuclear power, theoretically you might want to get behind, let's mitigate that risk in some way by making nuclear operators just as responsible as Ford and Magna, all those different companies for their own products. Um, for nuclear regulation, uh, simple technical solutions are not going to address these problems. That's what the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has been doing. Um, our current risk models underestimate the risk, uh, and they're being used in environmental assessments to portray uh, reactor projects in a very different way. We're not getting the full information that we should have. Um, and the Harper government right now is, it's been trying for years uh, to update the Canadian, uh, the Canadian Liability Act. Um, I've learned through access to information, the industry has asked them not to raise the limit too high because they'd have to pay more in insurance fees. What we should be doing is taking the cap off and also exposing the suppliers, like this company, SNC Lavalin, to some of that liability. And if we do that, we're, you know, I think we'll actually see where the real rubber hits the road if they're willing to actually take on responsibility and monetize, if they're gonna go ahead, they'll monetize that risk. And that's gonna level the playing field with renewables. That's how we start to get a different debate about these things. And with that, I think I'm done. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah.